We turn our attention now to the retrial for a Wisconsin man accused of killing his wife with antifreeze. That trial begins today. The Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled last year that Mark Jensen deserves a new trial in the 1998 death of his wife, Julie Jensen. Jensen was sentenced in 2008 after a jury convicted him. A series of appeals followed, and in 2013, a federal court overturned his conviction and orders that he be retried or released from prison. At trial, prosecutors used a letter and voicemails to a police officer where Julie Jensen expressed her fear that her husband was planning to kill her. But now, the Wisconsin Supreme Court said those statements cannot be used. In a November pretrial hearing, the judge ruled on whether or not to call the defendant's wife a victim. Let's take a listen to that. So the, the first one is the um, request not to use the word victim. Um, I, I'm going to start out by saying that Wisconsin's always been giving victims rights and um, 1993, we had a constitutional amendment, and it mentions victims numerous times. And now, as the attorneys are uh, also aware of, uh, we had Marcy's law passed. That's still the, the law of the state of Wisconsin. It hasn't been overturned. Um, and I believe when it was on the ballot, it was passed by 75% of the voters in Wisconsin. And Marcy's law... Uh, talks about, I think, at least 16 rights that victims have. And it mentions victims constantly. And there are enforceable rights through the criminal justice process, just like the accused person has. And one of the interesting um, aspects of Marcy's law is if the judge doesn't follow Marcy's law, he can have consequences. Not the attorneys, but the judge. So that's how strong victims' rights are in Wisconsin. And, and it talks about, and, and I think the exact wording on one of the sections talks about crimes committed by a defendant against a victim. It doesn't say convicted, it says committed. So um, I'm gonna allow the use of victim. Uh, it's very, uh, has a strong history in the state of Wisconsin, but we're not gonna have a trial uh, where we say victim 2,000 times. I, I think the state, uh, they they've, uh, have experience in numerous trials and they understand what I'm saying. But, but it's going to be allowed. Uh, this is a homicide case. Uh, there's, there's the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I think the jury will understand what their role is, that they, they have to look at the evidence and they base their decision on the uh, instructions I give as to jury instructions as to what the burden of proof here and all the other instructions and make their decision as to that. So the word victim is going to be... Uh, Allowed. They want to ask their question and then they don't realize why they can't. Um, and then, to be quite frank, sometimes it really destroys one party's defense or one party's prosecution. And they've worked so hard in their trial preparation, and suddenly this juror asks a question and they go, Wait a minute, we don't want you to go there. And the other thing is, I think the original Jensen trial, and Mr. Jambo, you can correct me if I'm wrong, was the longest jury criminal trial in the state of Wisconsin? Well, <clears throat> I don't know about that. It was the longest But that's one what I heard. Time. And uh, it may well have been. It was, it was a total of six and a half, seven And weeks. I think there's 125 witnesses. Am I right on that? Yes. Okay. This case is going to take a long time. And to ask jurors to sit for four, five, six weeks, I don't know how long, just with the witnesses that we have and just with the questions the attorneys are going to ask, and then we're going to throw in allowing the jury to ask questions, that's just going to make the trial longer, um, and I don't think it's going to get to the ultimate question because I think the attorneys representing the state and the attorneys representing the defendant 
know what questions to ask and they, and they know what their defense is going to be or what the burden of proof is and, and, and it'll all come in so we're, we're not going to have any uh jury questions well jury selection is underway for that and as you heard this is going to be a long case and with that criminal defense attorneys brian silver and casey are early back with me to dissect what we just saw what was your reaction to the judge's ruling on this brian so it's not uncommon you know i understand where the defense is coming from when they call someone a victim in a homicide trial it presumes they've been victimized you know, if they're using self-defense as a defense, if they're, they're, the defense is claiming that while there was a killing, it wasn't a homicide, the word victim may not be appropriate. So I, I understand where they're coming from, but I also understand where the judge is coming from. It, it's not exactly the most prejudicial thing that's gonna be presented in this trial. They're gonna have 125 expected witnesses. This is gonna go on for six weeks. At the same time, he's expecting the prosecution to conduct themselves appropriately and not be uh, using the word victim, 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 victim every four seconds, but just to use it in natural discussion. Uh, so it sounds like he took a balanced approach, uh, but I definitely understand where the defense is coming from. You know, some defenses, you're not challenging the fact that there was a homicide. You might be challenging who did it. Uh, in other cases, you might be challenging the fact that it is a homicide. You know, yes, there was a killing, but maybe the alleged victim uh, was the aggressor. And by the way, look what I just said. I use the phrase alleged victim. Uh, that may have been something that the defense should have countered for and said, judge, we understand where you're coming from, uh, but at least uh, have the prosecution use the term alleged. Uh, and that may have been another way to balance it. Casey, what could we expect from this retrial when you will look forward to this? What could some challenges be? Well, first, Michelle, I I'm glad that the defense even filed the motion in limine because this is the importance to preserve the record on appeal, which is how we got here. I do agree with the Supreme Court's ruling that the letter uh, should have been inadmissible because it was technically hearsay and violated the Sixth Amendment confrontational clause. However, I, I believe this time around, there's going to be uh, less focus on uh, the alleged victim in this case, and, and that's actually what I call um, the alleged victim whenever the state wants to call the victim a victim. Uh, th this case was very weak, in my opinion, from the very beginning, and the prosecution in this case relied heavily on this letter that the defense had uh, did not have the opportunity to cross-examine the witness of this letter. So I believe this shift will show uh, they'll probably focus more on her state of mind, whether or not uh, she was delusional, uh, suffered from any mental illness, or, uh, you know, was just afraid or, and made this up and possibly framed uh, the defendant in this case. So I believe that the defense is going to go harder and poke holes in the uh, state's uh, case to show that they cannot prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt because it's so weak now that the letter is inadmissible. Well, Brian, what are your general thoughts about voices beyond the grave? How much skepticism is there? Uh, well, it depends on the context and what was said. Um, you know, I did read that the law has changed, actually, since this appeal came down, and uh, it is now admissible. I, I don't practice in the state of Wisconsin. I'm certainly not admitted there, uh, in their state court, at least. Um, so I I'm not familiar with the rule that they're alleging. Normally, this would be hearsay. Um, but for the defense, uh, it really ties one hand behind their back. You know, the whole reason why hearsay is inadmissible is because the person who makes the statement or writes the letter or makes the allegation is not in there, they're in court to be questioned. And that's how we get to the truth in courtrooms is we ask questions. If you recall, there's a direct examination by the prosecutor, uh, so-and-so tell us what happened, what was done to you. And then the defense gets a chance, they get to ask questions too. So in this situation, when you're admitting a letter, it's a one-sided thing. The, the prosecution gets all the benefit and the defense gets no opportunity to challenge it. It's taken at face value, but of course they'll have the opportunity to argue that. Well, Casey, who has the harder job in, in this the, the, in this retrial, the defense or the prosecution? The defense attorney, it's always the prosecution. It's their burden, and it's a very high burden, and it's not the defense job to say, you know what, we didn't do it, and, and here's uh, the, the, why the, uh, the state's case is weak. It's definitely the prosecution, because the defense had the opportunity in the first trial to see their hand, their entire hand. So you have access to the record, you have access to the transcripts. So the testimony is not going to deviate as far as what was previously testified. 
to. So they pretty much had a preview to the first trial. So it, it will make it won't make the defense job easier, but it definitely will make the prosecution job harder because again they're sticking to their theory of defense uh, without the letter, which was their basically their star witness. All right, we certainly are awaiting that trial to happen and see uh, what will be going on in that courtroom.